this this meteoric rise in success. Uh, I remember when we only had six or seven of us in this state fighting for liberty, and now I check the counter and we're close to 700 in New Hampshire now. For the first state For those of us who are new to this and welcome you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts because believe me, the fight is not over yet and we need all the help we can get. Um, speaking of the fights, um, Mary Brewer is probably a woman who doesn't need a lot of introdu any introduction um, to the crowd, but for the three or four of you who might not know who she is, um, she is one who has uh, talked the talk and walked the walk. She's uh, run for office. Um, the state and federal level. She even ran for uh, the Board of Education. Could you imagine Mary Rewart on the Board of Education? Woohoo! Uh, yeah! Um, and her uh, most recent uh, run for office was uh, she competed for the LP presidential nomination. And a little trivia fact, some of you may not know, New Hampshire pledged the very first delegate to that convention for Mary Rewart. The topic of uh, Mary's speech tonight is the deadly secrets about soaring pharmaceutical prices. Uh, she has uh, worked for 25 years in medical research, uh, 19 of those um, of John, specifically on pharmaceutical research. So uh, she definitely knows her stuff, and uh, uh, I think that's all I really need to say. So, very reward, everybody. I have to tell you, I was very surprised by this award. They kept it a total secret from me. <laughs> Until they announced my name, I wasn't... <laughs> yeah! I, I didn't even expect it, so I want to thank, thank you all uh, for your votes. And, uh, well, I'm just thrilled. What can I say? So today, my topic, of course, is deadly secrets behind soaring pharmaceutical prices. But everything I'm going to say about pharmaceutical prices applies to the entire medical sector. It's just that we can, we can see it a little more clearly with pharmaceuticals. So if I can have the first slide, I'm going to talk to you about what, what it is I'm going to say today. You know, and uh, I have a little bit of trouble reading from here, so um, basically what I'm going to show you in the next half hour is that pharmaceutical regulations account for about 80% or even more of the current pharmaceutical prices that you pay when you go to the drugstore. Uh, these regulations, although they were passed to make drugs safer, have actually made them less safe. And um, they have really slashed innovation. This is probably one of their biggest, biggest problems, in addition to slashing prevention, which we'll talk about a little later. And there's been a number of other things, too. You know, basically about 20% of the U.S. population uh, that have died since 1962 when these regulations were passed were probably adversely affected. Their lives were shortened by these regulations. And so, as you can see, they probably, as you might imagine when you start thinking about this, they've, they've probably doubled the health care costs because it's much cheaper to take a pill than it is to go to the hospital. And they've really made health care rationing a necessity. We'll, we'll talk a little more about that later on. And of course, as in every situation when you regulate business, you create a cartel, and that's, that's true in the pharmaceutical industry as well. Now on the next slide, you'll see that basically, the changes that created all of this happened in 1962, the Kefauver Harris Amendments. And you go and click right down uh, the whole list there. Um, these amendments were supposed to address the idea of effectiveness. Prior to their passage, uh, you only had to show that a drug was safe for its intended use before you could market it. You didn't have to show that it worked. But a lot of other things happened, too. The FDA dictated how you had to do your animal testing and how much. And it also required an employee to sign off on the approval so there was somebody to point to if something went wrong. Whereas before, if no FDA employee objected, basically the drug could go on the market. And in addition, the FDA got um, the ability to tell manufacturers how they could advertise their drug and how they could label their drug. And that's why when you look on television, you see these ads for the drug companies, you see this big laundry list of side effects because that's FDA mandated. And finally, um, FDA had oversight of manufacturing. Before, before these laws were passed, basically 
unless somebody lied about what they put in it, the FDA couldn't do anything. One of the first things the FDA did when these laws were passed is they put 50% of the manufacturers out of business for manufacturer violations, which simply meant not that the drug was uh, not there or not in the right amount, but that the FDA didn't like the way manufacturers documented their process. Now, one of the interesting things about this whole thing, as you can see in the next slide, is this emphasis on effectiveness, which is how most people actually know about the Kefauver-Harris amendments. But you know, drug effectiveness is very difficult. I mean, does it have to be effective in everyone to be considered effective, or most of the time, or sometimes? And is it effective on its own, or do you have to compare it with placebo? In the next slide, you'll see uh, um, this little um, cartoon. It's, it's a fake. Um, I see, you can't see the top. It says, FDA approved sale of prescription placebo. <laughs> now, this is a fake drug ad, okay? This is something that The Onion in Austin put together. And you can actually find it on their website. But it looks just like a regular drug ad. And let's see, if my, my laser pointer that doesn't really, isn't really laser works here, I want you to look at this ad. You see it's for sucrosa. Sucrose is the name for sugar. And notice the tagline, it will work. And that's what placebos do, they work. That's why we run placebo-controlled trials, because you can give people a sugar pill and some of them will respond favorably. So there's really no such thing as a drug that isn't effective, and there's no such thing as false hope, because the placebo effect is a real effect. We just don't understand it, so we don't talk about it much. And, and that's probably why the Supreme Court, uh, in the early, early 1900s, actually ruled that laws demanding effectiveness testing in drugs were not constitutional because effectiveness was a matter of opinion. You know? But uh, however, the FDA in the 1962 Kefauver-Harris uh, Kefauver amendments managed to get around that. Now this created some problems, as shown in the next slide, and the biggest problem it created was that it increased the development time of drugs from four and a half years, as seen in the light blue squares, which is what it was in the 60s, or I'm sorry, what it was prior to the 60s. And then as you see these dark red squares, you can see that every year the development time went up and up because basically this was a blanket charge for the FDA. They would increase regulations every time, and the drug companies couldn't even sue because the Upjohn company, the one I worked for prior to the time I joined it, actually tried to take the FDA to court and say, hey, you can't impose these regulations willy-nilly. There has to be some system here. And they used uh, one of their drugs as an example. But the courts ruled that the FDA did have the power to impose these regulations, and the drug companies would have no recourse. Uh, so that really gave the FDA carte blanche, and every year they increased the regulations. Why? Because if anything goes wrong with a drug, and every single drug has a side effect of some sort, and Congress's attention is focused on that side effect, Guess who has to come and defend themselves? The FDA. So they're, you know, they're really in a bad place. They can't approve a drug that's both safe and effective because there's no such thing as a drug that's totally safe, and there's no such thing as a drug that's totally effective. So you know, they stick their neck out every time they approve a drug, so they keep delaying the approvals, and that's what protects them. Now, on the next slide, you might imagine that some people just couldn't wait that extra ten years and that was the AIDS community. So they basically opted out, and they did it totally illegally, and they were not stopped. What they did is they started bringing back drugs from overseas, because at that point in time, our FDA was so strict compared to Europe,